that. Session six. So, but if anyone's needing at um, the other sessions, please let us know, and um, she can put that in the chat for you. So, on behalf of Community Living Algoma, I want to welcome you today to our training session with Al Condalusian Creativity. I also want to welcome our CLA employees, board members, and over 25 um, agencies from across Ontario and an agency from Saskatchewan, as well as members of the Town Council of Horn Payne. Some of our history to date in working with Al, we go back to 2015. And as an organization, we were really struggling with um, people supported um, having friends, people having social roles, people being integrated into the community, intimate relationships, and so on. And we kind of looked at that, how can we continue to move our organization forward when we were really struggling with those areas? So we um, embarked on a journey with Al to look at and focus on um, community participation and to just explore that and what does that look like for people and just get out in the community, build relationships and really look at social isolation and loneliness. And then summer 2020 came and we were looking at um, COVID and how we can continue to move our organization forward and look at how to keep people safe with um, recognizing that we're in a new world. So we started having conversations with Al in the summer and how could we get back to focusing on relationships and what's really important in people's lives. So we talked about focusing on neighbors, what's in a person's one kilometer radius, and what, what are relationships outside of paid, paid supports and, and how, how we can do that. It was also managing the pandemic. So we, talk, we talked about that and embarked on a community engagement project that's a two-year project. And we have a micro piece and a macro piece. And the micro piece is the training sessions that you've been a part of or are part of today. Also some work that we're gonna do with people we support in regards to target groups and focus groups where they will um, go out into the community. Um, you know, <laughs> we're waiting on the um, stay at home orders that they've been lifted now. So we're working on um, how we're going to move forward um, for people to participate in the community and look at um, how that will work. And then we're also focusing on the macro piece which is a, um, an advisory council where we're working with all people in the Algoma district, all leaders of, of people. And it's not to focus on people with disabilities, it's how Algoma district can be a more welcoming community for all people. So we're focusing on that. So now I have the pleasure of introducing Al. Many people know Al and I've said this before, but I'm gonna go ahead and <laughs> share the information. So Dr. Al Condalusi has been a leader in community building, human services and inclusive advocacy work for the past 50 years. Holding a PhD in MSW from the University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Condalusi has been the CEO of CLASS, Community Living and Support Services, a major nonprofit community building organization in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania from 1973 to 2019. He holds faculty status at the University of Pittsburgh <clears throat> in the schools of social work and health rehab sciences and is author of seven books, including the acclaimed Interdependence, The Route to Community, 1995, and more recently, Social Capital, The Key to Macro Change, 2014. In 2018, he received the key to the city of Pittsburgh, the highest civilian honor that can be given to a community member. He serves as a consultant, advisor, and human service coach, and is on a number of nonprofit boards and government commissions of state, local and national levels. He helped found and convenes Interdependence Network, an international coalition of professionals, family members, and consumers interested in community engagement and macro change. And all his contact information is at the end of his PowerPoint. So please welcome Al. Great, great. Thank you so much, uh, Tanya. And, 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 and uh, let me reiterate uh, a warm welcome to uh, uh, not just all the, the good folks at Community Living Algoma who have been a part of our project and, and the training we've done, but to uh, so many of our allies and, and colleagues uh, ar around the country um, uh, joining us today. We have over 25 organizations. Many of the organizations, as I looked at the list that uh, Tanya had sent me, um, are, are organizations that I've had the opportunity actually to get to meet or get to know um, uh, and, and to share ideas with. So uh, I am I'm delighted uh, that you've been able to find your way to this session. I certainly salute um, you know John Policiccio and 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 Tanya and, and all the all the the good folks at uh, Community Living Algoma for uh, sponsoring these sessions and and really opening them up to uh, to the community that uh, that's really a you know a wonderful gesture and 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 I think greatly appreciated so thanks for for plugging in and today 
we have a, we really have a, a session that we're going to be doing that is uh, that is uh, different than what we've talked about in the past. As Tanya said in her uh, introduction, you know, over the last uh, four or five, six sessions that we've done, um, we've really focused in on community engagement um, as, a, as a topic and how people can uh, build relationships and, and the importance of relationships in, in our lives. Uh, and certainly all of us know this very personally with the pandemic, uh, the stay-at-home orders, uh, some of the the realities we've all experienced over the last uh, year, year and a half, actually. And, and uh, well, can yes. I interrupt you for a second? I, sure. Someone's saying they're having a hard time hearing. Is it possible to turn up your volume a little bit? Okay, well, let's do that. Um, we'll try to get it up full and uh, <clears throat> let me speak a little louder as well. So okay, thank um, you. Hopefully, hopefully that'll be, uh, will be better. Uh, I'll try to project a bit more. I just turned the volume up um, uh, to the highest uh, level on my computer. So, uh, um, and so today we're really shifting gears, and we're going to really look at a at an interesting uh, topic, uh, the topic of creativity. And uh, you know, it's it it really is interesting when you when you think about. Uh, creativity in a, in a general sense. We, we, those of us in human services or in, in civic services, like most of the folks on the call today, uh, don't really perceive ourselves uh, to be creatives. We usually think creatives are, are artists and, and, you know, uh, photojournalists and, you know, and, and people who are, are in entertainment as really being the creatives of our culture and of our society. Uh, but actually creativity is really a, a, a phenomenon that can apply to any um, you know, area, focus area. Um, and, and, and certainly I think for those of us in human services, and that's where I've spent my entire career, um, I think we can be more creative and we ought to uh, find ways uh, to be more creative. Um, I think if you look historically over the challenges that we've had uh, in uh, the various agencies that are on the call, uh, in the work we do in the various communities uh, that we're located in, is to try to get people involved, engaged in community. Um, places to work, places to live, things to do, recreation. You know, all of those things have been part of our agenda for, for the, the, the founding of all of our organizations. And, and yet we struggle. Uh, we know that um, even before the pandemic hit, we were struggling to get people engaged and involved and working and doing everyday um, uh, uh, tasks in our community. And that folks with disabilities have been relegated to segregative and congregative settings and special programs and separate um, identities and separate realities. Um, and, and I think some of that, obviously, there are some reasons for those things. Um, but I also think that our creativity is, um, has, you know, has not been tested uh, to the level that it is. And so today I want to share uh, some, some things we know about creativity, some ways we can become more creative. Um, I also, um, I'm going to be sharing some things from a, a course that I attended at uh, Disney World. Um, in fact, I'm holding up the, the book that we had, the textbook that we were given as part of that, which is essentially, it was conducted by the Disney Imagineers uh, on being more creative. And, and uh, so I'll share some of the things that I learned in that session and some of the independent things that I've been reading um, and, and trying to incorporate in my own uh, practice uh, to be more creative uh, as we move through. And we're going to be doing a couple of creativity exercises, and I think we're going to have some fun with this. Know that this topic of creativity um, really can apply in so many ways. Uh, in our in our lives, not just in the work we do, 
but in um, with our families, uh, in our neighborhoods, and in other realities where we find ourselves relating to other people. How can we be more creative? And so let's let's kind of get on. And as Tanya said in the um, in the introduction, if you have any questions or uh, comments, uh, please uh, put those into the chat room. Uh, Tanya and, and Corey will be monitoring the chat room. Um, I'm going to go through some content on creativity uh, right now. Uh, I think Tanya sent out the uh, PowerPoint. So you have this, this information or you, you will have it. If you don't, uh, we'll make sure you get it. Um, but let's get, let's get rolling. Let's think about creativity. Now, inventive creativity is oftentimes one of the very first things we think about uh, when, we, when we look at creativity and those novel activities that produce benefits for not just the user of the creative device, but, but for the person who generated it. Um, and, and that um, it, it's intriguing that um, research on creativity has found that uh, our highest point of creativity is when we're five years old, right? And its lowest point, at least in terms of some of the research done looking at creativity, is around 44 years of age. Uh, and it seems as creativity is not just uh, learned, uh, but also unlearned as we advance through age. And this is really an interesting, you know, this is an interesting phenomenon. Most of us on the on the call are parents, and you know, in raising our own children, I think you know we see some of these creative things that our children come up with, and that and how they they manifest uh, creativity. Um, and it's also interesting to know as we get older, the more bland <laughs> you know kind of stuff unfolds. Now, the the big debate with creativity is, is it born or can you actually promote creativity? And, and really, the answer is really both, that there are, there are things, obviously, there are some people who are uh, gifted in terms of their creativity. Um, we, were, we were chatting before we started with, uh, uh, with uh, you know, needing to have some music uh, while we're waiting for people to get into the room. And, and this, this got me to think about my musical partner. I um, formed, when, we re, when I retired from class, we formed a group called the Doo-Wop Doctors and we play music, right? We play uh, oldies music. And my partner, this guy was born creative. I mean, he is just, he just has this gift and he's always had it from the time we were kids all the way through his life. And of course he's made his, career uh, as a creative jazz artist. And, um, and I know for me, I've got to work at being creative. I've got to, I've really got to practice it. But, but in reality, we can, in fact, take some of the native things that we were born with and also build uh, some, some creative skills and abilities. And, you know, one of the neurological things about creativity is we know that our brains um, we have two temporal lobes, a left lobe and a right lobe. And this, this picture on the slide sort of slicing off, you know, and looking down on the brain, we see the left side, which is very analytic and logical and very, um, you know, linear in its, in its focus. Uh, the right side of our brain is really where creativity rests, right? So for those people like my partner, John, um, uh, you know, his, his, he's right side dominant. I mean, this guy, he, he just, he thinks creatively all the time. Um, other people are left side dominant. And so the creativity is a little bit more challenging. This, this image is even more uh, illustrated uh, to kind of show the cubicles of the left side and the, and the, you know, the gardens uh, of, of the right side of our brains. And, and, you know, there's, uh, there are little exercises that, uh, that you can do to sort of 
uh, identify what side of the brain is dominant for you. And one little exercise just to do right now is if you could take your hands much like, you know, just open your fingers and then, and then intersect your hands, do it uh, fast, maybe three or four times and then stop. And then see which thumb is on the top, is on the top of your hand. If you do it the other way, it feels weird. One way feels really natural. And if you see which thumb is on the top of, right? Now, for me, it's my left thumb. And, and what, you know, what that suggests is that your right side of your brain is a little bit more dominant. If your right thumb is on top, then that suggests that your left side of your brain is a little bit more dominant. Um, again, not always, and this is not deeply scientific, you know, it is very subjective, but, but we know that the right side of the brain is really where creativity rests. And, and that in developing creativity, you know, you ask the question immediately, you think, how can I become, a, you know, if I'm left brain dominant, how can I become more creative? And um, the formula is that there is no actual formula. There's nothing that you can um, just immediately apply and automatically are going to become more creative in your thinking um, because there's lots of environmental things around us that can stunt creativity. Fear is really the most uh, you know, powerful inhibitor of creativity. Fear that people will laugh at this idea, fear that people won't take me seriously, fear that um, you know, uh, folks will think I'm weird, or whatever uh, might happen. Fear can be a real inhibitor of creativity. Now, in, in some of the things that I've, I've seen, the, the course that I took at Disney, uh, Disney World, um, other classes that I've taken uh, separately, suggest some steps related to creativity, right? Um, so freedom, being the first step, that's kind of an empowerment. It's almost a, a, a permission uh, to think out of the box. You know, we always talk about out of the box thinking, right? Uh, expression is giving voice. Uh, creation is generating ideas. And then action is making those ideas uh, become real. I'll get a little bit more into this as we move forward. But, um, you know, John Holt, one of the one of the researchers on creativity says, uh, we enter school as question marks and then we graduate as periods. And, and in some ways, if you stop and you think about schooling in Canada and the United States, really in any, any Western kind of culture, uh, schooling can really stunt creativity because what it does is that it puts it into a box. It, 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 it says, you know, you go to school, and at, at, at seven o'clock in the morning and you start your you take your first class and maybe that class is arithmetic and you take that class for 45 minutes and then a bell rings and you walk to your next class and now you sit down and you're in your geography class and and you're there for 45 minutes and and then you go from geography to English or to you know, literature or, or social studies or whatever the topic might be encapsulated and structured in. And so in many ways, schooling is the first effort of stunting creativity because it encases it. It, 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 it begins to suggest that there are particular times when you can be more creative than, than others. And uh, and, and, and those things really aren't true. You know, each of us follow our own kind of chemistry and our own, you know, biorhythms as it relates to, um, you know, when we, we have, you know, more, you know, creative sort of juice and, uh, and when we are also stunted uh, just in terms of natural forms. Now, one of the things, one of the um, uh, classes I took on, on creativity introduce this idea, these stretcher size ideas, which are ways to stretch your thinking. Um, and, and that notion of literally kind of pushing 
us outside of our comfort zones, outside of the boxes that we find, uh, you know, there. And, and, and sometimes in stretcher size um, activities, you find things like Rorschach, um, you know, images where you're asked to look at this image and, and, and then, you know, what does it say to you? And what can you see in it? Uh, what is dominant? What seems to be possible? Almost like when we were kids, remember watching the clods, we'd sort of lay, you know, on the, on the grass and look up at the clod and, and then really in some ways be able to actually see an image uh, in, a, in a cloud, right? Similar here with uh, these kinds of Rorschach. I'm going to show you a couple of these as we move forward from a sense of stretching our thinking. Um, and creativity is from, some researchers suggest it's found when you're about to lose reality without losing control. Um, and this idea of being able to get out of those boxes and those structures that somehow, some way, those routines, those habits that sometimes contain us and, and allow us to get into some other kinds of zones without losing control. Uh, without literally letting go, uh, you know, as a, you know, cartoon, uh, oftentimes with uh, these Rorschach kind of things. And <laughs> here's a guy saying, trying to pronounce Rorschach with a mouth of soup. Um, but here, let's do a, let's do an exercise right now. Um, no matter where you're at, if you have a belt on, I'd like you to take that belt off right off your, 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 your slacks or your, your, your pants, just take the belt off and then put it back on going in the other direction. You know, stop the thing when you put your belt on in the morning, if you wear a belt, um, there's a particular way that you're habituated to thread your belt. Um, and most of us kind of follow that kind of habitual um, direction, but if, if you're now challenged to actually put it on the other way, right? To put that belt on, if you normally go you know, to the left with your belt, now I want you to try to put that belt on uh, going to the right side. Uh, and, and the fumbling and bumbling that happens there, just because of the containment, the habit of always doing things one particular way. Another quick exercise, if you have a watch on, Take your watch off and uh, put it on your other hand, on the other arm, and then try to, you know, if you don't have a, if you don't have a, uh, you know, a, a twist of flex, try to fasten it on that other arm. And it actually, you know, it, you fumble and bumble to do that, uh, to get it um, on. Um, you know, often I, I teach a course at the university on creativity. And um, when I have my students do these exercises, um, it, they they will they'll 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 laugh because I have them put their take their belts off and put their belts on the other way, and then they they leave their belt on. We finish the lecture. They go about their business on campus, and then when they get home, they fumble to try to get their belt off because it's it's on the wrong way. So the typical way of taking your belt off is addressed. Here's a third little exercise, and, and you know, if you're sitting at your desk um, by your computer, take your non-dominant hand, I'm right-handed, so uh, taking my left hand, you know, get the pen in there, and just write your name, try to write your name in a cursive style uh, with that non-dominant hand, okay? And, you know, how, again, how weird it feels as you stumble through and almost looks like like you're in second grade again, <laughs> you know, as you as you write your name with that non-dominant hand. So in some ways, these little exercises begin to sort of say, how can we break some of those uh, those habits and those uh, uh, those boxes that we get sort of put ourselves into just because of years and years and years of routine, right? Now, in creativity, actually, some researchers have, have broken this into stages, 
okay? Where, you know, if, if, if we have a challenge, uh, we're at the preparation stage, right? So what is the issue I'm dealing with? What, what, you know, and it could be anything. What is the issue you're dealing with, with your, you know, with your child? What is the issue you're dealing with in, with a work assignment? <clears throat> What's the issue you're dealing with um, in a community group you belong to? And then the second step is once you've identified the issue, you've kind of, you've kind of clarified it, uh, then really beginning to zone in, define and frame that particular issue. Um, and then a lot of a lot of creativity buffs will tell you there's an incubation stage, and and I'm sure this has happened to you where you get an aha moment on on something. I, I know when I was working full time, <clears throat> I would often go out for a run uh, at lunchtime, and um, and when I I would be out on my run without even you know I'm wrestling with a problem at work. And, and, and I'm out for my run. And while I'm running, all of a sudden, you start to, you know, you start to see the problem a little bit differently. This can also happen when you're sleeping or when you're getting ready to sleep and you're laying down and you're kind of going through all the, the things that are, that are in your mind about a challenge that you have, you know, at work or a challenge you have at home. It doesn't really matter. The incubation stage is, is a, a stage when you go into another, another place. You know, Plato, the, the philosopher, um, was a runner. He was a wrestler and a runner. And that was back in the time when athletes were also, you know, um, academics. And, and, uh, and Plato would take, he would do his lectures while he ran with his students, right? And when I read that, I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm, you know, I was a runner. So I went to the dean at the university um, school of, that I was teaching at the School of Social Work. I went to the, to the dean and I said, I'd like, I, 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 is it OK if I take my students for a run instead of doing the lecture? And I'll do the lecture while we're running. And the dean, <laughs> the dean thought, well, they thought I was crazy anyway over there. But the dean said, this, this is really true that you're crazy because the students might have a heart attack and then the university will get sued. But, but this incubation phase is a phase when we really sort of put the challenge into the back, in the back parts of our, the recesses of our mind. And then we get about our business or we do something else. And all of a sudden we get this illumination, this aha. Um, and then we're at the verification stage. Now, researchers on, on creativity and, and, and folks like Rollo May, others that really wrote a lot about creativity, suggest uh, these three questions when you're, when you're con confronting a challenge, whatever that challenge might be. Um, and, and you think about, well, I've got to do this. Well, what if I do that? And then what else? And then why not? These three questions, what if, what else, and why not, really push us a bit. And they begin to create, they, they, they give us permission to begin to think outside of the habitual boxes that we oftentimes uh, try to address problems or issues that we're dealing with uh, around. So what if, what else, why not? Now here's another image. And immediately when the image comes up, you know, you see the flowers and the butterfly going to land on that flower. Um, and, 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 but if you sort of back up or if you allow your mind uh, to open up a bit, you also see the woman, a woman's face in that, um, in that image, right? So, so that sort of ability to kind of get outside of the reality of that picture, which is flowers, blossoms, and butterflies, and really now see another, another image, right? an image of a, you know, of a, of a woman. Um, now, some, some characteristics of creativity. Um, we know that oftentimes we're, we're, we're really 
challenged to come up with a quick response. But long rather than short is always takes you to a perhaps a, a, a better place. Sometimes the short, quick um, reactions can actually be the worst. Um, so, so these are just some characteristics to think about as it relates to creativity, um, being able to uh, uh, being able to push ourselves to a, another place. Uh, know too that that there are times and places, there are biorhythms, and there are sort of personal realities that people have in terms of being creative, right? Um, that Duke, as a known fact, Duke Ellington, the wonderful composer and a musician, did his you know, best work while he was riding on trains. Okay? Um, Hemingway you know, uh, would, would go to cafes in, in um, Havana or in Key West or uh, you know, other places where he lived. And, and it was these early morning times in these cafes where he was most creative. Um, and, and you might have a creative spot too, or creative place. Uh, often I know in, you know, in work, um, you know, when, when I was working at class, uh, that sometimes if I was sitting in my office, that was like the last place I could be creative, right? And, and, and so getting out of that, getting out of that zone, walking around, you know, at, at the agency, we had a cafe, a little cafe uh, that, that we had at our agency where, you know, coffee earned and people kind of come and go, folks would have their lunches there. And often I would just take my laptop and I would sit in the cafe and um, uh, there were distractions, obviously people coming by, oh, Al, how you doing? You know, and there, uh, there, there was those realities, but there was also this really, uh, this freedom of, of, of getting outside of the zone of my office and the pictures I had in my office and, you know, the bookcase in my office and the desk in my office and the phone, you know, th those kinds of things can stunt our creativity. So being able to find your creative zone, a place where you're most creative, um, becomes, you know, a, a part of, be of, of you becoming more creative, right? So roles in the creative process, innovation, seeing the obvious before everyone else, synthesizing, which is combining, um, extending, which is expanding ideas, and then duplication, being able, you know, you hear a good idea from somebody else, why not, right? And, and so that notion of the things that can enhance the creative process uh, become really, you know, really key. Um, knowing something without understanding why you know it is the soulmate of creativity. This is from a couple a really, really interesting creative uh, couple. And here's their book. It's called Fanning the Creative Spirit, um, Gersh and Gersh. Uh, it, really chock full of really interesting um, ideas and ways of pushing creativity. So here's another image, you know, and you, when you first look at this, you know, what do you see? And there's a couple, obviously a couple different things that immediately can come to your mind. You know, uh, some of you might see an old woman an old woman with a babushka a bonnet on, and you see her nose is long and the black part at the bottom is her mouth, right? Others of you might see the young woman whose face is turned and you just see the side, the profile of her cheek, and you see the cut uh, of her chin and you see her ear, right? So, these notions of what we see in what's around us can really begin to prompt and promote. Um, I, you know, the last time I did this presentation, um, and I showed this image, someone uh, typed in the chat room, 
I still can't see the old woman. <laughs> you know, what is it about the old? So in, in some ways, you know, that notion of what you see um, is, is, you know, is inherent in, you know, your perceptiveness, right? And uh, this is a, a thought by Mitchell. Uh, we need to make the world safe for creativity and intuition, for it's creativity and intuition that will make the world safe for us. And again, remember that fear factor um, uh, is, is the biggest inhibitor to, uh, to creativity. Now, there are other inhibitors to creativity. And, and, and here are a couple that are classically um, identified. Uh, defining the problem incorrectly or defining the issue incorrectly or inappropriately. Uh, judging too quickly um, uh, in, in, you know, in, in someone coming up with an idea that might be creative, um, uh, stopping at the first acceptable idea when there might even be better ideas a little further down the track. Remember that, that knee-jerk reaction of, of quickly solving something can really, you know, impede us. Um, and then lack of support when, when you have a, an idea and, and no one is supportive of that idea, it sort of dies on the vine. I had a, I had a, a, a poster uh, in my office and the poster had nine cells to it. And the first cell uh, was uh, up at the top was a light bulb. And the light bulb was fully illuminated. And it said, I have an idea underneath the cell. And then the next cell next to the light bulb was the same picture, the light bulb, but a little less illuminated. And then underneath it, it said, I don't think we could afford that. And then the third light bulb at the top, a little less illuminated saying, we've tried that before. And then the next three cells, the light bulb getting more and more dim with each, with each um, cell and underneath it, another reason to shoot down the idea, another reason to, um, uh, to you know, basically now uh, the, the, the idea that was started in the upper cell on the upper left. And then at the very bottom cell, the bottom right, the light bulb is totally out. And, and the caption says, well, it was just an idea, right? That notion of how other people, how other folks around us can actually stunt creativity is real. And we know that most people tend to be negative. Most people tend to sort of think the worst. Most people tend to see the problem more than the solution. And, and, and some of that is how we we're raised, right? Uh, as, as kids, you know, one psychologist, one social psychologist um, did a study that discovered that by the time a child reaches the age of 10, they hear the word no 185,000 times. No, no, stop that. No, 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 we did. No, we can't do that. Right? That notion of literally um, stunting, you know, the, the, the creative uh, process. Other inhibitors we know are hurry and habit, right? We talked about habit, how we get kind of stuck in those boxes. Worry and fear, we mentioned that. And also judgment. We think that somebody will judge us as being weird. Or wow, wow, that's a wild idea. I mean, you can think now about your colleagues. You might be sitting with them right now uh, during this session. And, and, and some of your colleagues already have a reputation. Uh, well, they're, 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 always, they're always out on the, on the fringe. You know, they're really weird. That may, that, you know, that, that may be the immediate judgment that people have about other people. Um, that they're looking to solve issues uh, with. So the inhibitors are real. Fear colludes with our most conservative self and allows us to stop before we try, dismiss before we think, and mock before we imagine. Right? 
and 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 understanding those impediments become really important to unchaining us and liberating us because there are phrases that actually kill creativity right and you know these you you've been in staff meetings where people have actually said this stuff right? it was a good idea but oh that costs too much oh my god we can't afford that yeah oh it needs a little bit more study we need more research on that well let's just sit on that for a while and um the boss won't go for it <laughs> It was a good, you know, these, these kinds of things um, are, are immediately crush a possible idea. Now, it might be that the idea when it first gets initiated is raw, right? There may be loose ends to it. And, and, and that clearly um, it, it, it's, it may not be ready for prime time, right? But, but nonetheless, you know, if, if an idea gets killed before it can get out of the cocoon, um, then, you know, then we all lose. Um, so what are some ways that we can, that we can promote creativity? Right? And, and the first is just let's stop criticizing ideas. Right? And maybe, you know, maybe the idea is wild or weird, but let, let it be, right? In fact, rather than trying to put it down, how might we be able to enhance it? Um, maybe make the idea better. Maybe maybe elongate it a bit. Um, and and this idea of hitchhiking, uh, which is basically taking an idea and then enhancing it, you know, combining it, adding something to it, you know, shifting something just a bit from the idea. Uh, to strengthen the idea. Okay? Um, now, here are some ways we can do that. Okay? Um, when, when you're in a staff meeting and you're sitting down and you're, you're trying to solve an issue uh, that your organization is, is struggling with or your community is struggling with, um, then encourage people, right? That notion that um, we could do that or, you know, maybe, yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. And, way to go and then you know just making people who come up with ideas um make them validate them right validate those people um you know there was a there was a great book that came out called um uh, the thinking caps and it was by edward de bono a harvard um a harvard psychologist and uh, the thinking hats suggested that people have a bent. People on a team have a bent. In fact, when we get to our, our September session on groups and teams, I'm going to talk a little bit more about, about De Bono and how teams can, can be more vibrant. But the thinking cap suggests that we each have sort of a, a bent. Uh, and if you think about your team right now, think about the people that you normally uh, work with or work together on things with. And, 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 then, and then just think about what their bent is. I bet you there's a member of that team that, that's always up, positive. And there's probably a member of that team that's always down, always negative. And then there, there's probably a member of that team that, that essentially uh, is creative. And then there's a member of the team that's very realistic, right? I mean, all these things are bents. And what De Bono suggests is that a good manager, a, you know, a good leader, um, recognizes that people have their bents and, and really suggests how do we uh, organize that in a way where we can maximize the use of people's bents. I'll have more on that in September when we're, when we're together. But ideas versus solutions, right? Um, an idea drives fundamental aspects of stories and environments, right? Solutions are responses to situations or requirements. So ideas may not be solutions. And, and solutions might not have very positive ideas generating uh, from it. The two are not mutually uh, exclusive. There is some interlay 
uh, but there's also some uniquenesses. And synergy is always potent in thinking about creativity. And, and, and so to this end, let me, let me just kind of do a quick exercise with you as best as we can on Zoom, right? Um, so, so let's try this. On a sheet of paper right now, I want you to write down three things that you can do with this paper clip. It's just a simple paper clip, right? We, you probably have one on your desk right now. You might, might pull it out if you have one on your desk, see if you can find one. Let me get one out of my, out of my paper clip thing. So here's my paper clip, okay? You have one too. So what, what I want you to do is write down three things that you think you, know, you can use the paper clip for, okay? It should be pretty quickly, um, you know, um, three uses of this little thing. Okay. okay, so now you write down your three things. And here's what we want to do. Now in the chat room, I want you to write down two of your three ideas. Just chat, put them in the chat room, two of your three ideas. And if you're in a group, just somebody who's at the computer can, can, can do this. Don't, not everyone um, needs to have a computer, but just, just add, let's, let's see what's going on. And, and monitor the chat room. Just look at, at what, what's coming out here. The uses of the paper clip, okay? So I'm gonna go into the chat room here myself, straighten it out, use it as a hook, pipe cleaner, clip papers, fix a bra. That's always good use. Um, attaches, you know, mask, right? <laughs> Look at these ideas that are coming out, right? Now, the interesting thing is each of these ideas come out, that spurs you to think about another idea that's that's a, maybe associated, right? So not just fix a bra, maybe fix a jock strap. I don't know, but you could use the, you know, what are some of the other uses, right? So now, as we're doing that, let's 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 go into let's push this just a little bit further. Now we add at least two new things to the growing list that are in this chat room. Right. And and what we're beginning to discover is the synergy of the ideas, what you're reading, what you're seeing that you may never have thought about in terms of a use of a paper clip um, is broadening. That synergy is pushing you a bit more in your own creativity. Right? Um, you know, it's really it's really fun about this exercise when when I'm able to be with a group live when I'm with my students or if I'm doing a workshop on creativity, I'll break the group into different sizes, right? So I'll have one person, you know, go into a, in the side of the room, maybe a, a couple dyads, a couple triads, a group of five, a group of ten, and then a group of twenty. And I'll give them this challenge with a paper clip. How many ideas can you come up with with this paper clip? Right? And, and it's unbelievable that the larger the group, the more creative the ideas, the more ideas that get generated, right? Synergy works. Synergy is really, really powerful in terms of, um, uh, of, of, of creating uh, something better. Collaboration is always, always at the core of innovation. Um, you know, we, 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 use, we think that innovation is this solo activity, right? The guy in a garage in San Jose who comes up with a computer, a personal computer, like that aha moment. But that's not how it works. That what we know about innovation is the more people who can participate, the more um, creative, uh, the juices and the ideas. Walter Isaacson, great uh, author, wrote a book called The Innovators. And in the book, The Innovators, what, what Isaacson did was he followed 
the creation of the personal computer from its first acknowledgement in the literature to the development of this that we all have in our hands right now, right? How did we go from the very first idea of a personal computer uh, to having a, a, a personal computer right in our hands and in our pockets and in our purses? And, and what, what Isaacson did is he discovered that the very first uh, reference to a computer was made by Lady Byron, Lord Byron's uh, daughter, who uh, in her diary in 1836 referred to an analytic machine. First time ever, uh, 1836. And so he starts his book there. And he begins to follow, how did we go from this idea of an analytic machine to this computer in our hands? And it's really fascinating to see how each stage of innovation uh, for the personal computer was always tied to people sharing an idea, to people debating, to people discussing. Um, so social capital, which is a topic that I know some of you have heard me drone on about, but social capital, which we, we know is associated with good health and happiness and longevity and all these other things, is also so associated with innovation right? and creativity. So another image, kind of looking at this, look at it a couple of times, maybe close your eyes, look at it again. So some of you see a guy playing saxophone. Right? Others of you see a woman, you know, kind of a silhouetted, silhouetted face of a woman, right? Um, and, and so these kinds of images, as we sort of broaden our thinking, um, uh, uh, push us in terms of creativity. Well, there's a question in the chat that says, what if you always see both right away? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good thing. I think that that, that shows that, you know, there's a liberated sort of piece of what's happening uh, in your mind. And, that, and that's really good because that, that pushes. Now, the, the, the sad thing is the folks that say, what woman? <laughs> you know, I, where, uh, I see the saxophone player. What are you, what are you talking about a woman? Uh, so, you know, that, that really shows sort of like a, a, a bifurcated or a limited a sort of viewpoint. Um, so back to the framing, right? Well, identify your challenge. Write down the facts as you know it related to the challenge. Frame the challenge as a question. And then sleep on that question. Just go for a run. Go for a walk in the woods you know, uh, take it home with you and, and, and when you hit the sack. Now begin to harvest your insights. And then you begin to test out your best ideas, right? You test them out. So this idea, this, there's some, there are a couple different creative approaches that advertising uh, uh, companies will use. My son Santino works for an advertising firm in New York City, right? Right on Madison Avenue, right? The, the, the proverbial um, ad, you know, ad companies. And, and there's, there's a couple different, I'm gonna show you a couple of different things that ad companies actually use, the creatives in ad companies. And this first is called synetics, where you, you take something familiar and then you associate it with something strange, right? Um, you see the Budweiser frogs and some of you might remember back Budweiser, Anheuser-Busch, uh, had a um, an ad campaign uh, where they used frogs, right, to promote advertising. It was like the gecko that, you know, the Geico gecko. Um, so this synetics takes something familiar and pairs it with something strange and, and you know, can begin to Pro prominently display what they want displayed by juxtaposing it with something that's strange or, or out of the ordinary. Mind mapping is another, another approach. Um, 
uh, where we uh, start with a central image in the middle of the page. They use mind mapping a lot in, in advertising firms. And then they sort of go out from that image into other things. They, they, go, they go beyond, they push, they begin to push the limits. Or affinity techniques. Um, so affinity techniques uh, uh, require teams to generate potential solutions to a problem. You oftentimes see a whiteboard or stickies, you know, little post-its where you have people putting uh, their uh, potential solutions to a particular problem that's displayed on the whiteboard and then begin to cluster uh, some of those similarities. Uh, start to see if some of those similarities begin to make sense and then get people to kind of vote on uh, or get some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, agreement on them. Nominal techniques are other ways that, that are, you know, I use nominal techniques all the time in group work that I do, where I'll, I'll, I'll put out a trigger question uh, to the group. And then I'll say, silently work on this trigger question, right? Whatever the question might be. How can we get more people included in existing you know, community groups, right? That might be the question. And then have people work on that privately and then begin to um, harvest the ideas in a serial fashion where you go person by person around your team and you pull out um, you know, each person's answer to the, the, the question, the challenge question, uh, right? And, and, and then, you know, you begin to get some dialogue and discussion on some of those solutions, or you begin to uh, collapse certain solutions that come out in the nominal technique with, with other people. So again, you know, learning from other, other paradigms how we can be more creative using mind mapping, using nominal techniques, using affinity uh, kinds of approaches. The ACE technique is another one where you adapt, combine, and exaggerate. So you adapt a solution to, a, to an issue, you combine or you connect um, two essential pieces, and then exaggerate. Or, 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 or blow that out just a bit more, okay? So there are qualities uh, to creative people, right? Um, the, you know, we know that there are things that are associated with creativity, curiosity, willingness uh, to generate ideas, being aware and observant of the world around them, uh, taking risks, being able to see the old in new ways, dreaming, um, you know, fun. So let me kind of begin to wrap this up and then we'll, we'll take questions. Uh, I, I, I just finished reading a fantastic book. I was down in Florida for a couple of weeks visiting our daughter, first time we had seen her in a year. And um, I brought with me a book by Walter Isaacson. Remember I told you he wrote that book called The Innovators? Well, he wrote a book a couple of years ago about on Leonardo da Vinci. And Isaacson is fascinated by creative people. In fact, his, his books, his biographies, uh, he wrote a biography on Steve Jobs. He was the official biographer of Steve Jobs. Jobs hired him actually to write his biography when he knew he was dying. He wrote a biography on, on Einstein and on Franklin, um, on da Vinci, on on Jennifer Dobna, who won the Nobel uh, Prize for Chemistry uh, last year in, in being able to break the RNA code uh, uh, through CRISPR. So he, he's fascinated by these creative people. So I get this book on Leonardo da Vinci and I, I, just, I just reveled in it. It was an amazing book. Is Leonardo da Vinci was he, he saw himself as a designer, an architect, and an engineer who also paints. Right? That's how he introduced himself. Um, he, he saw himself as a designer. And um, 
obviously he's most known for his artwork, right? The Mona Lisa, uh, The Last Supper, uh, some of his incredible iconic artwork, which uh, we still uh, revel in today. Um, but da Vinci um, was eclectic and able to span other paradigms and um, was, came up with ideas in his notebook for things that weren't realized for generations. And he would write challenges to himself in his notebook and Isaacson sort of talked about this in his in his in his uh, biography, uh, he would write a question like, "Find out the length of the tongue of a woodpecker." Right now, now here's a guy that that painted the Mona Lisa, right? And 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 he was he was fascinated by the the tongue of a woodpecker, right? Um, or the wingspan of a dragonfly. Um, so, so uh, at the end of the book, um, uh, Isaacson summarizes some of the key things that Leonardo embodied in his life. Right now, um, Leonardo da Vinci was this—he was really a unique, a unique character. He was. Oh, well, there's a comment in the chat that's um, from Monique talking about his flying machine and yes. that uh, he was a thought-provoking, amazing, weird thinker. That's that's exactly right. He was always on the edge, and and uh, he was also very flamboyant. He was gay. He was vegetarian. He was, you know, he was just, you know, out there. He was he was unique in so many ways. But here's some things that Isaacson summarizes. Lessons from Leonardo da Vinci and being creative. Be curious. Relentlessly curious. Seek knowledge just for its own sake. Retain childlike sense of wonder of the world. Observe. Start with details. See things unseen. Go down rabbit holes if you must. Get distracted. Respect the facts. Procrastinate. Uh, this illumination, this incubation, uh, Leonardo lived that. In fact, Leonardo had more commissions that he never finished than artwork that he did finish uh, that was, that was you know, then displayed. Um, think visually. Leonardo always would sketch in his notebook. Avoid silos. Let your reach exceed your grasp. Indulge your fantasy. Collaborate. Remember synergy. Make lists. Be open to mystery. Right? Um, just wonderful lessons from probably the most creative person that ever walked the face of the earth. So we start grade school with colorful crayons. And then we graduate from college with disposable black pens. Right? We're born with creative tendencies, and then we lose them over time. So go back and find your crayons. This session was really designed to try to kind of push us, because the more creative we can be, the more we can begin to solve some of those challenges, those vexing challenges that we've dealt with for years, getting people included in community, getting people to be, you know, a part of everyday life, helping people um, uh, connect in community. These are our challenges. How can we be creative about them as we look to, to solve them? So here's some contact information for me. Uh, if we don't get to a question, a comment, or a reaction that you have uh, up until our time, uh, 1130, um, please feel free to drop me a note um, or, 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 you know, give me a phone call. Um, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop sharing, and we're going to go to our matrix, uh, and, and then I'm going to ask uh, Tanya and, and Corey if they could kind of look at the chat room, let's see what comments or what what questions uh, people might have. Okay, okay, so first comment, Al. Um, 
I'm a firm believer in Mozart theory. Listen to classical music to open spatial reasoning. I'm a writer and it allows me to see more context. And that's from Cindy. Yeah, Cindy, uh, that, that is such a, um, you know, there is some neurological, um, you know, sense of creativity. Oliver Sacks, the famous neurologist, he wrote the wrote the the book Awakening was one of his his um, uh, you know most popular book, uh, but Sachs really believed that music can in fact release um, potentiality, creative potentiality, um, and and classical music has withstood the the you know the test of time in promoting creativity. I don't know if uh, rap music uh, necessarily does that. Maybe maybe it does. I don't want to be opposed uh, to that. But certainly in the classical um, uh, moments when, you know, when we can kind of close our eyes and just sort of listen to a sonata and, 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 and then, um, you know, really see what, what, what we might be able to come up with in terms of a challenge that we face. Great point, Cindy. Thank you. Other other thoughts? Um, there's nothing in the chat, Al. If anybody has anything they'd like to throw in the chat or if they'd like to throw their hand up, feel free. Oh, here we go. Um, thank you for I am crazy and see things no others see. I see beauty and wonder in all things. Try to see a positive spin to a negative outcome. I'm so glad to be included in this session. It makes me realize I need to just take the time to let the idea build and ask some others for help. That's nice. from Monique. Monique, thanks so much for, you know, for, for, for that comment because it's, it's absolutely true. You know, the creatives um, in, our, in our culture over time from, you know, time immemorial, I mean, Leonardo da Vinci was really seen, you know, as, as like a weirdo um, you know, he dressed in ways that were really unique. Uh, he, uh, you know, he sort of saw the world differently. In some ways, people might have seen him as a misfit, right? Um, and, and oftentimes, creative people are, you know, they push the lines. You know, and sometimes a creative person can push the lines so far that they go into the abyss, you know, um, and, that, and that has happened to creative people. We know that uh, mental illness, mental health, uh, drugs and alcohol um, sometimes um, uh, are, 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 are in uh, this space. And, um, and that doesn't mean that you have to, you know, if you're, you're a creative person that you're, you know, that you're on the fringe uh, of mental stability, uh, but but literally, you know, just being allowed to 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 think out of that box and uh, and and to be able to uh, see things and and Monique's a point about you know seeing the good in things and rather than the bad in things that bent uh, toward the positive um, uh, that. Uh, you know, we we all can work at that a bit. We can all work at looking more at the positive. We see something that's out of the ordinary, and and rather than say, "Oh boy, that you know, look how weird that person is dressed," and it's, rather than that, saying, "Wow, look at how those colors that normally wouldn't go together how they how they do blend, how they do create this sort of you know interesting." you know, gestalt in, in terms of, uh, of, 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 of what I, what I see. Uh, and so I think we all can work at some of that. That's why, you know, that very, at the very beginning of this talk, we talked about or is creativity born or, or, or made? Um, and the answer is really both that, you know, people, we were all born with some creative spirit, but, you know, being able to, uh, uh, work on getting ourselves out of that, uh, out of some of those boxes that can stunt us. And maybe even not, you know, uh, positioning ourselves more with positive thinking people rather than negative thinking people. You know, we've all been around whiners and moaners, and we know that when somebody's whining and moaning, that, that just, that just saps the hell out of you, right? I mean, it's like, 
you know, who wants to hear that stuff all the time? So, so the choices we make with who we decide to spend time. Now, sometimes we, we don't have choice. We're, you know, we're on a team, we get assigned and, and we've got to make the best of that. Uh, but if we do have a choice, let's, let's choose positive um, if we can. Okay, um, Al, there's quite a few, there's a few more there. So the first one, great presentation. Can you share the title of the Disney book again? Yeah, in fact, the Disney book is called The Imagineering Work Workout. The Imagineering Workout. And it's by the Disney Imagineers. So it's no one author. And you can get this through the Disney website. There's also other, other books. You know, when I attended this, this Disney workshop, this book was our, uh, was our, our textbook, but we, you know, there were other, you know, resources that were, were given to us. And it was, it was really, really great. It was, it, there were people from really all over the world. We were, we were, um, we were at the Disney Institute, which was really their educational sort of, uh, property. Um, uh, and, and, and it was just fun. And we didn't, we didn't, we, you know, we worked a little bit in the morning and then we worked a little bit later in the afternoon. We had the afternoons off to, you know, go to the parks or to lay by the pool or to, you know, do what we wanted. It was really a, it really promoted, you know, you thinking creatively. Uh, next comment, fear often has me holding back and not discussing things, or I jump on an idea without letting it build. Yeah, yeah. Th that, that, that reaction is classic. Um, and, you know, and all of us have had, you know, fear, the fear that we're going to be ridiculed or, or embarrassed or uh, somebody is going to, you know, if, if, even if we haven't fully thought an idea out and we we present parts of it um that because it's embryonic you know other uh, other people can kind of shoot it down or 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 it, it just like any embryo it needs nurturing to uh, to continue to uh uh to you know to grow and 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 the same is true with ideas that um uh, some people are fearful about putting the idea out because they, you know, they just think it's premature. Um, but if you have a supportive group, if you have a group of people who really work together uh, to try to, uh, you know, for, and, and, and in some ways, who cares about who gets the credit? That's the other, that's the other, you know, inhibitor here is that now well, if I share this idea, somebody's going to steal it. And then I won't get credit for it. And, uh, and, you know, in the end, that selfishness, that isolated selfishness, you know, might, uh, I mean, Leonardo's notebook was full of ideas that ultimately other people, you know, built on and, and, and you know, for the helicopter and I, just other things that he imagined um, in his notebook uh, that, you know, didn't come to fruition for centuries. Um, but, but, you know, he sketched it, he had his, his notebook was out there. And uh, so in any event, I think, I think your, your, your points about, about fear are real. Let's try to overcome them. Great. Al, we have about eight more. Yeah. Um, I really like the sketches, uh, the paperclip exercises. These will prove to be useful at team meetings. Yes. Helping people see that we all see something different, that everyone's views are part of a great solution. Mm -hmm. I can see that it will really help people to build on others' ideas. That comes from Charlene. Charlene, thank you. I, and and uh, use any of this, all of this, uh, to promote creativity in your organization and, and for yourself. Uh, next, next one. Uh, it's amazing the type of ideas that people we support come up with, born from ideas that we don't see, like for crafts and stuff. And that's from Darlene and Brian. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Darlene. Uh, uh, that these kinds of things, um, you know, just if, if you pause and you just start, think about how we can continue to get sucked back in. Um, so trying to find ways to stay 
uh, to stay creative. And I know on the call today, there are some really amazingly creative organizations I've visited with them uh, that are doing, uh, doing uh, incredible uh, things. Um, and I want to salute that. I want to salute that sort of that risking uh, kind of ability uh, for uh, for some of the organizations that are that are on this call and some of the folks that I've gotten to know who have taught me a lot of things. Next point. Um, thank you for kinking the work we do to creativity and helping us see that creativity, of course, includes more um, traditional arts, but it's so helpful for us non-artists to see ourselves in our work as creative. Curiosity and getting unstuck and seeing every situation as potentially new, even though we think we have seen um, we have seen the same problem or situation over and over. I love the frame you shared on how to frame, cre uh, frame this process will help me moving forward to frame solution finding in the future. Yeah. And, and that's from who? Uh, that's from Julie. Hey, Julie, thank you. You know, Julie, uh, just, uh, you know, some folks might perceive themselves to not be terribly creative or artistic. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I think of myself in some ways like that. Uh, when, when, I, when I started reading this book on Leonardo da Vinci, I, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm not an art buff. And um, uh, I took an art appreciation class in college. That's about as far as I got uh, in terms of understanding art. But when I, when I read this book, one of the fascinating things about it that Isaacson, who really is brilliant in terms of his interpretation, what, what he did is he, he took uh, da Vinci's uh, artwork and he would, you know, it's, he, he has an illustration of it in the book and then basically explores what makes this particular image really creative. And he talks about what da Vinci did the shadowing and where the lighting comes in and, and the color uh, schemes selected and, and, and sort of the interpretation of the body and, and, and the gesturing of the characters in the, in, the, in the artwork. And as I read that, it really just broadened my, you know, I'm thinking, wow, what have I been missing all these years? Um, you know, I went to the Louvre and I, you know, I stood in front of the Mona Lisa, like, you know, like thousands of other people. And I just looked at it and I thought, wow, my first reaction was, wow, is that small? <laughs> you know, it, was, it, was, it wasn't any of the other kinds of things that made the Mona Lisa iconic as a, um, as a piece of art, as a creative work. And, and so it's never too early. It's never too late. I, I'm, you know, I'm now hungry to go back to the loop <laughs> and as soon as this damn pandemic is over and I want to get in front of that Mona Lisa again. And I want to, you know, I want to see it uh, through some renewed eyes. Um, and I think that's, that's what, you know, we, you know, you know, you don't worry about what your age is or, well, I'm not that creative or I really never was good at art or I was never good at this or music. It never, it's never too early. It's never too late. Al, we still have about 10 more. So the session got me thinking of the creativity of the people we work with. That is those with intellectual disabilities, autism, et cetera, who bring an amazing sense of creativity to their lives. We can learn and apply so much from what we gain by their insights. I find it so important to remember that creativity is all around me and to be open for inspiration from everyone. And that's from Ron. Ron, fantastic. Thank you. What, what, what a great insight. Next one, Corey. Uh, Monique, um, I was very sad to hear that being 44, I'm at the end of my creativity. <laughs> I couldn't have imagined how my parents felt with me as a five-year-old. <laughs> well, no, never fear. I mean, I think that that, that statistical sort of uh, uh, juxtaposition of age five and age 44 uh, was just trends. Um, let all of us on this call, we have 100 plus people, let's all work to try to push that damn 44 uh, further up the scale um, uh, by showing our own creativity throughout our entire life. For sure. Next point. 
Uh, Tanya, love the concept of try thinking. What if, what else, why not? To think outside the box as service providers, we tend to put up barriers when are planning. We, are we back if we on? approach it from this perspective, the sky is the limit. Oh, we might have to wait for Al to come back. Looks like we lost Al's connection. We'll give him a second to reconnect. I thought it was maybe my internet, but it's Al. Yeah, he's gone completely. He's disconnected. So we'll just have to watch for him to come back in. Oh, oh I think I'm back there in. You, there you go. go. You're back. Yeah, <laughs> my, my apologies. I think it was on my end uh, no that problem. we had that problem. And I, didn't hear the last uh, question or comment, uh, Corey, okay. that you were making. Okay, so the last uh, the last one I read, the, uh, Tanya loves the concept of try thinking. What if, what else, why not? Think outside the box. As service providers, we tend to put up barriers when planning. And if we approach it from this perspective, the sky is the limit. Right. Again, bravo. That uh, That's excellent, excellent perception. Got it. Rebecca echoes Ron, this serves as a good reminder to the value in supporting folks to access their creativity, both as a tool for us to deepen our relationship, but also as an opportunity for us to learn from their creative ideas. Again, bravo. That um, I think the whole notion of um, folks who have figured out ways of living with a lot of different harnesses um, that uh, that that they have in their lives, or or that have been that have that have unfolded uh, for them, Th there's lessons aplenty there. So so I I think I I just want to underscore that and echo. Uh, let's be let's just be conscious and observant uh, of the creative stuff around us. And we got one more, Al, so which is pretty good timing. So I feel the younger generation is too quick to run to others for solutions to problems or ideas instead of sitting back and digging into creativity and coming up with their own ideas. I look forward to my coworkers having the opportunity to watch this also. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I think that um, attention span is, is, is an issue. Um, and that sometimes uh, we, we know that the attention span is really is seemingly going down each generation, um, the attentiveness to, uh, to an issue. Um, but I, I, I think that there's also assets and pluses there. Um, and, and the whole incubation period um, I, it still plays out. So even if somebody is not tending to something longer than than maybe a generation before them did does not mean that there can't be the incubation period of being creative so um so i i, I think that uh, the the sky is the limit uh, for us and uh, i really appreciate um the uh, the opportunity to share these ideas uh again a little bit a field from the whole community engagement um, conversation that we've been having, but still, um, I think, critically important uh, to us being successful you know, in the work we do. Know that on September 14th, we have uh, our next session, which is really going to focus on groups and teams and teamwork. Got some really intriguing stuff and some new, um, you know, newer research and uh, newer ideas to share on that. So hopefully you'll be able to plug in with us uh, for that. I'm going to flip back to Ta Tanya for any final uh, comments before we close out. Thanks again. Well, before we go back to Tanya, Tanya just commented, we do have time for a few more questions if, if you're okay with mm -hmm. that. I am. Okay, so um, there was just to the last comment, um, uh, Wendy would like to disagree with Becky. So being a young 50, I work with some of the most amazing young people and there's some agreements on yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, age, is, what is, we often just say age is, you know, it's just sort of a, you know, just a, a number. And, um, you know, the creativeness that we have, I, you know, I hope as I, you know, as I move into my senior years, uh, 
that 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 my creativity is is just beginning to kick out and you know as you know i've turned to music now as ways and 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 art and other things to continue my journey and i think we all can 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 keep at being creative yeah al there's quite a few thank yous in thank you wonderful ideas um very different perspectives uh thank you from community living welland um, always enjoy your sessions, Al. And then Sharon's closing with young and fresh creative minds love working with a variety of individuals of all ages. That's great. Well, thank you. And, and all the organizations that are, that are on the call, you know, um, community living um, um, affiliates, um, Huntsville and Perry Sound and Live Work Play in Ottawa. And, you know, just all my, my buddies uh, that, that I've had the opportunity to meet and, and to work with and to, and to grow with. I'm so glad that you were able to be a part of this, but mostly really appreciate uh, Community Living Algoma uh, and, and uh, Tanya's, um, you know, hard work and administration and organization of, of putting this all together. So I'm going to flip over to Tanya to, to conclude. Okay, well, thank you very much, Al, for a wonderful presentation. And for those people um, who are on the call who didn't get a copy of the PowerPoint, just, you just send me an email and I can send off that PowerPoint to you. And if anyone's needing information from the previous sessions, I can send that as well. Um, we also, like Al said, um, we're off for the summer in regards to the sessions, uh, but we'll be doing some our community engagement project work. Um, so September 14th is our next session on power through groups and teams. So I know that some people on the call have already um, emailed me, but if you know of some people who are interested, just let me know and I'll sign you up. And I usually send a Zoom link closer to the date just so that it doesn't get buried in everyone's emails. And then October 12th, we have change, challenge and opportunity. And then November 9th, we have measuring loneliness. And December 14th, we have measuring social capital. And all those sessions are from 10 to 12 Eastern Standard Time. Okay. So again, thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful summer and we'll see everybody in September. And great. thank you again, Al. And thank, thank you everyone you. for joining today. Thank you. Have a great summer, guys. See you on September. See you in September. <laughs> da -da -da. <laughs> I do want doctor's uh, voice. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Take care, guys. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Corey, can you hang on for a minute? Are you able to do the stop recording?